what I want you guys to do is I should structure this so you guys can all see it uh, see it best best for me. So this is effectively what, what we want the stack to look like right here on slide 165. If ESP points to this type of configuration, when the return instruction happens, We'll call virtual protect. We hack in a fake return address for it. And we'll need to set up its arguments correctly so the function actually executes right. And um, so if ESP points at a, a fake stack frame, is essentially what we're setting up here, virtual protect will be called. And this is what will happen. So what I want you guys to do is look at the MSDN page for virtual protect X and figure out what these parameters should be. And I want you to actually write them in your um, course notes there because that'll help you remember everything and keep track of it. And it'll allow us to sort of craft this fake stack frame in our payload file as well. So basically, at the point where we're gaining control of EIP, where EIP equals that placeholder value in your file, we're going to change that to the address of virtual protect X. And after that, we're going to put these things in. And then after that stack pivot, ESP is going to be pointing at this fake stack frame that we have created. And a virtual protect X will be called. We'll change the permissions on our shell code to be executable, then do some other stuff on our shell code will execute. But I want you guys to use that MSDN page to figure out exactly what these arguments will be because we have to pack these into our payloads so that fake stack frame exists and all its parameters are specified completely and accurately. Now you could actually use virtual protect instead of virtual protect x. The only difference between them is uh, virtual protect x has this additional argument, the process argument. Um, but we're just going to stick to virtual protect x. It's what I have the slides for. But you can do it with virtual protect. Uh, the only difference is virtual protect x. You know, we have to tell us that we want to change the memory permissions for our process. So we put a negative one there. I just go ahead and told you guys that negative one just means use our process as a process. What is the address? Does anyone know what the address of virtual protect X is? 7C80 1961. Other people get something similar? Alright. Is that if we had ASLR, it would wouldn't be so easy, right? We'll talk about that. So non-ASLR, virtual protect is going to be at the same address each time, all right? What about the return address? What should this be? Anyone know? Yep. Should be the return address of the shell code. Yep. So um, give me a general address for what we're going to use for that. 13FDE0. 13 FD, I'll just say, because it's something to change for people. All right, H process, what should this be? And what is that in hexadecimal? What should this be? LP address. The basis. So I put 13F000, zero, zero, zero. kind of gives you the low end of the stack ring. Mm -hmm. oh, does anyone have any other suggestions? I mean, I'm, I'm leaving this up to you guys. Do you guys want to go with that? The base address of the stack? I don't know if that's the base address of the stack. I was just looking for the you know, address on the stack. You can give the real base address. address. Mm -hmm. the stack base, stack limit is 136000. Zero, zero, zero. All right, so I want a consensus. Who wants 
what do you guys want to use for LP address? And obviously, you're welcome to choose your own parameter here. You can do it your way. I want you guys to explore this a little bit. But um, for the class consensus, who wants to use the absolute address of the shell code? Raise your hand. Who wants to use the address of just a stack page, like um, Ford suggested? Everyone's being shy. So, okay, what did you suggest? One three six zero 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 six zero zero zero. Is that right? Everyone feel happy with that? Feel good about that number? We'll, we'll see if Papa Legba likes this number too. <laughs> size? What do people want for the size? Well, 1,000 hex takes you to the end of the stack, takes you to the stack base. Stack at the top, end of the bottom. So, 1,000? Yeah. So you want this to be 13, 6,000, and this to be 1,000? No, that's not right. Sorry, 4,000. No, no, no. I'm not thinking in hex. What is that? It should be 13F000. So Zeno says 13F000. So we got some uh, disagreement here, so I'll put both of them. My initial thought was F2, because that hits our range. But then I adjusted it to the 6, because that's what uh, the TEB says is the stack limit. OK, so Ford, what do you want the size to be? F is fine. It, oh, it's for the size 1000. One, zero, zero. All right, and Zeno, you know, what do you want the size to be? 1,000. I think he may be implying that he has a different right, tab so than me because he, he said oh. his his stack limit was something that mine wasn't right. Mine is 14, 140,000, right? So it's all going to depend on where your buffer is relative to your stack. Uh, so, you know, that's the stack base. The limit is the low number. What's, what's your stack limit in your TV? Uh, my, you're right. Yeah, the stack limit is one three six zero zero zero, and the stack base is one four zero 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 zero. Well, the point is, there's like a number of options you can use here. I want you to sort of explore this on your own. The point is, Ford, are you actually going to um, your buffer new protect? From there? I don't think so, based on the buffer base address. Well, um, yeah, it depends on which. As long as I use the right number. I can't do that much hex in my head. I just wrote one four zero 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 minus one three if that's six what zero, you, zero zero zero. If that's what you said Let's to program the size up. too, then that would be better. Because right now you have written yeah. on the board size one thousand. So what do you want the size to be? I guess nine zero zero zero. Nine zero zero? Okay. Right? No. Eight zero zero zero. Eight? A. 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 One is just to learn to do hacks. All right, well, we're all going to learn whether or not Papa Legba likes our fake stack prematurely. Based on what values we choose. All right, so um, new protect. What do you guys want for this? X40. Uh, X40, huh? Read, write, execute. OK. Old protect. There used to be a pointer somewhere in your stack. And you know, okay. I set it to one byte, one word before my return address. Interesting. A lot of people can choose their own stack address there. So what I want you guys to do, and we'll break for lunch here in a minute, but I'll want to introduce the um, the lab for you before we take off, in case that people want to work through lunch. So after the stack pivot occurs, ESP is pointing right here. So essentially, we want to construct a fake stack frame in our payload for the virtual protect call that looks like this. So essentially, where EIP is pointing when you um, gain control, so where in your file where you found where EIP is uh, being taken hold of, where you got that placeholder value, you should put in your fake stack frame. 
And then when the return happens, instead of executing your placeholder value like AAAA or whatever you put there, it's going to execute virtual protect, and this is going to be the stack frame that it's considering, you know, with all, for all of its parameters that are passed to it. And if you set this up correctly, virtual protect will be called, the permissions will be changed, and you'll return to your shell code. That worked. Huh? That worked. Oh, you got to work? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone, anyone else get to work? It looks like right here. Okay. It'll probably take most of you a lot longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> Papa Legba was happy with port for some reason. I sacrificed a couple dead chickens. So, Ford, what you should do is identify, this is for you only since uh, you got this so quickly, consider you're in an ASLR environment, okay? What of these parameters is no good, and how will you deal with that? So what isn't good is these stack addresses, you don't know what the hell they are. Stacks haven't been realized. Virtual protect, you don't know what that is either. The only thing you know the addresses of is flash. So I'll let you think about for a while. And if you want, you can even try to construct your payload so that the only fixed addresses in your payload are addresses pointing into flash, because flash will not be random. If you want help, you can look at that blog post I showed you. But you can do that. Even though ASLR isn't uh, turned on, the, um, what you should do is try to make your payload file so that there are no fixed addresses except ones that are putting pointing in the flash. All right, Ford, I'll race you to that because originally I was looking for a ROP gadget for that, so I've already eliminated one possibility. point forward for the getting a, a better Our memory range, range but who can find ROP gadgets faster with Windabug? Hmm. And uh, so you guys doing that, try to look at that blog post because um, it talks about how to do this in detail. I probably won't go over that too much with the class, it's pretty complicated, but um, if everyone really wants to and everyone gets done with the lab quickly, I can try to focus on more. So, uh, Corey, so, so were you mentioning about the uh, address range? So if I, so I just, so basically I adjusted this with the address argument and then DW size argument, then it worked. So are you saying that if I put like uh, not the page boundary, then you would not make the protect in the, uh, in the, uh, the virtual protect rule going to fail if I don't put it as a you know, uh, page range? Yeah, so some of these parameters, um, virtual protect will fail if like uh, I believe that um, size has to be page aligned, I think. I mean, you'll have to look at the MSDN page, I don't recall exactly. But if it's failing, what you should do is um, set a breakpoint for the virtual protect call. Make sure all the parameters look co correct by looking at ESP uh, right before or right as the function begins executing. If they look correct, step out of the function with the GU command and WinDebug, and then look at the EAX register to see if the virtual protect function um, is reporting itself as succeeded or failing. And if it failed, it's probably because one of these addresses is a page aligned. Or it could be that if you chose 13F000 and made your size like 2000, it will have um, tried to change permissions on a page that isn't mapped into memory, perhaps, if that goes beyond the limits of the stack. And that could cause the virtual protect call to fail. Corey, do you have any reason why the 13F000 uh, and 1000 doesn't work, though? So I, I, that's what I used originally, and then I just changed the uh, constants, and the exact same thing worked. 
So it's it seems like the Virtual Protect didn't like just doing that hex 1000 worth of range. Is there any reason that you can think of why that would be? No, that, that should have worked. Um, that should have worked. That's what we used in the last class. I'll have to look at that over lunch. Okay, so for like Ford and Veronica and Zeno, let's talk about what you guys are trying to accomplish. So currently with the first payload you did, you had your stack frame look something like this. Right? So your stack, your stack frame looks something like this. Now let's talk about why this wouldn't work in an ASL environment. First of all, don't know where this is. The address of virtual protect is going to be randomized. It's kernel 32 um, is randomized. For term address, you won't know where this is. This is fine. Don't know this. You don't know what page of memory that your uh, your shell code exists on because it's on the stack, presumably, and you have no idea where the stack is located. It's going to be a come in at a different base each time you restart the process. That's okay. That's a size field that can be hard to put in. This is okay. No good. Don't know stack addresses. So essentially what you have for your stack frame in um, the ASLR environment is unknown virtual protect address. Unknown return address. F F F F F F. You know that. Unknown LP address. Unknown Scott or you know that. So this is what your stack frame will look like in the file. Probably you'll just hard code these to help identify them. Just help try to keep everything organized in your payload file. And what you need to do to bypass ASLR is you'll have to calculate what these addresses are using recurrent oriented programming and then write them into your stack frame before you actually arrive at your stack frame. So it's that when you finally are going to execute virtual protect and ESP is pointing right at that pink virtual protect stack frame before the return address ha before the return happens, that will make EIP equal to virtual protect. This stack frame has to be completely filled out. All these unknowns have to have been calculated and written forward into that stack frame. Yep, so um, Zeno is pointing out a couple things that could help you. For regular virtual protect, you still have the old protect address. You could just make it point somewhere in the data region for Flash, though. Is that will be writable. It will be a known location. And you honestly don't really care uh, what the result of that old protect address is. So you don't care where it's written. So you can make this. 
address of data region and flash, which will be known. What about LP address and return address? How do you guys think we should calculate those or go about figuring out what they are? Well, the LP address we can get from the ESP. Yeah, so you have to know what, ask is, ESP, right? what is one thing that um, allows us to know where our return address should be, where our general stack addresses are. We know at the, at the time where we begin our return-oriented programming that ESP is pointing at attacker-controlled data, so that ESP is pointing in the general vicinity where um, LP address and return address should be equal to. So, we'll have to do some math <coughs> off of the current value of ESP and write it forward in memory. Okay. All right. Now, so ESP, the ESP register points to you know about where our return address and LP address will be. So that's how we'll calculate that and write it forward. What about virtual protect? How are we going to figure out that? And finding the export address. Uh, you could do that. That would be very difficult. I mean, it, it would, you could definitely do that. It would require a lot of return-oriented programming. There is an easier way. Yeah, Ford cannot answer because he looked at the blog post. The question is, how do we calculate what the address of virtual protect is with our return-oriented programming payload? Zeno suggested looking at the tab in the pub and walking that link list and eventually you can discover what the base address for kernel 32.dll is. You could definitely do that. However, that is a lot of return oriented programming. It's hard enough to do it in shell code when you're, you know, just executing x86 opcodes in will. You can find any function that's also in that DLL that's in non-randomized and flash. That's reference and then reference that address plus some offset. So yeah, that's basically right. What we can do here is that if we were to look at the import address table for flash six, we would see that it is importing functions from kernel 32.dll. Pretty much every binary does. So at the time our return oriented programming payload begins running, there will be absolute addresses pointing into kernel 32.dll located at a fixed address, namely Flash's import address table. In fact, it turns out the very first entry in the import address table for, for um, Flash 6 relevant to kernel 32 points to like uh, get time zone information. This will allow us to know what the address of get time zone information is, which is kernel 32 function. Once we have that, we can derive the address of virtual protect because even though kernel 32 has been randomized, the delta between get time zone information and virtual protect is not. So we read in what the address of get time zone information is, then add some calculated delta to it, and this will give us, present us the value of virtual protect. And that allows you to calculate all the information that you need for that big stack frame with return oriented programming. ESP points at what you need approximately for the return address and for um, LP address. Old protect you can make point anywhere that's writable, like uh, K user shared data or um, a data region in, in Flash 6. And virtual protect we can calculate by figuring out the address of some kernel 32 function in flash 6's import address table and then adding like an offset to it and that'll derive the address of virtual protect. And so you can, you can accomplish all of this with these set of gadgets. I don't want you guys to read the whole blog post because it will kind of tell you how exactly you should do it, but this gives you all the tools that you need at exploitresearch.com wordpress.com and using these rock gadgets you can string them together in such a way that you'll derive the virtual protect address and the ESP address and write them forward 
into that big stack frame with incomplete information so that when ESP finally points to the big stack frame, all the information will be filled out and you'll return to virtual protect with complete information and you'll be good to go. So I'm just giving you guys the gadgets since we don't really have a great way to um, scan for gadgets in this in here because I couldn't put Metasploit on the VMs because policy stuff and unfortunately I don't have a copy of my personal gadget scanner on my business laptop. So I can just tell you that this set of gadgets is complete enough where you can accomplish what I just described. If you want to try to do it your own way, you know, don't limit yourself to just doing it how I'm describing here. There are other ways you can do it. Like Nuno suggested you could um, walk the tab in the tab and figure out kernel 32 that way. Um, in which case, though, you'll probably have to look for other gadgets. Um, and I guess to do that, you could use that Gruden Hill um, wind debug script and just copy and paste the output to an editor and try to, you know, do like a search for what you need there. You get all the arithmetic right with add 18. You uh, don't need it. You can get all of arithmetic with this uh -huh. add ECX, EBX minus 3, FCC 3D00. So let's talk about for you people working on the return oriented programming, um, how we would put some of these gadgets together to accomplish something useful so I can help get you started. So, let's come over to the board here for a second, Bill. There's the mostly happy scene, unfortunately. Okay, let's start off simple, guys. If we want Let's assume this right here is my payload. Okay, ESP is pointing right here in my payload. How would I construct a raw payload such that EAX equals dead beef? Well, let me take gadget one. So gadget one. So we would, what would we put here? What would what should ESP be pointing to? Should it be pointing to the opcodes top EAX or to the address where those opcodes exist or what? The address where those exist. So what exactly is that? So one zero 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 one six F zero. Okay. Go on the opposite and side if you're doing your kind and then of dead traditional beat. convention. So all oh, right. Yeah, sorry, I'm switching up the order that I'm doing this in. I was just doing it in the order that it would appear in the file, yeah. kind of top to bottom, but since I've been doing my stack diagrams the other way, I'll try to do it that way. So we would have, okay, I'm just going to write pop EAX. Just know when I'm doing this, I mean the address of the gadget pop EAX, okay? And then right here, we'd put the value that we want EAX to contain. So what would happen is, at the point where we uh, execute our, our stack pivot, ESP would point here. And it would do, this actually signifies pop EAX return. It would do pop EAX. So it would pop this value right here. And then ESP would point right here. Okay, so let me think of another uh, good example to show you guys. Well, like if we wanted to do, say, an arbitrary addition. Okay, we've got a gadget seven. So in order to use that, we've got to get a value in EBX that corresponds to some memory location plus 3FCC 3D00. So yeah, let's talk about how we would do an arbitrary addition to ECX. Let's assume that ECX contains something we want, like, um, let's assume ECX, we've already gotten the address 
of uh, get time zone information at ECX. And we want to add some offset to it, which will derive the address of virtual protect for us. How will we do that? So once again, we've executed our stack pivot or whatever ESP is currently pointing here. Yep. Thank you. Uh, increase the size. Is that what you said? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Can you guys see that better? My DVD cast people? And also, again, this is on WordPress or uh, exploitresearch.wordpress.com. In case it's hard to see that uh, those fonts and so forth. So the last working backwards, I guess the last thing we want to do is number seven. Okay. So yeah, the last thing we'll want to do is um, add ECX EBX minus three F. CC 3D00. So before that, we have to load EBX with some address offset by that number. Okay. I mean, I have to believe. So what to my very first ROM gadget be? Add EAX plus EBX kind of things in the gadgets. Is there some? Is that not the case? Is that why you did like? Did you do? Okay. That's not the case. That's all we're using these bizarre ones. There might be, but um, the gadget scan that was run to produce this output limit itself to one instruction followed by a return. So you could expand that and allow yourself multiple instructions before a return, but then you would have to keep track of what's known as side effects and making sure none of those extra instructions between the instruction you want and the return screw up your current payload, and it gets really nasty having to keep track of all that. So all these rock gadgets, this is the best we can do if we just look at one x86 instruction followed by a simple return. And that is that is absolutely the best we have. There's no other better arithmetic operations for that particular flash system. This is what return-oriented programming is all about. We've got to work with what we got. We can totally accomplish what we need to with these. We're just going to have to, you know, go a little bit out of our way. The typo on number six, there should be an extra zero on there. Okay. On the address. Okay, so um, how are we going to do an arbitrary add to, um, to ECX? So we have to get the target value into an address. So we have to get the target value into an address, and what address should that be? Something. What is the target region we can use as kind of like a scratch area that's definitely writable and readable? Data area of flash. The data area of flash. Data area of flash is going to be our little scratch workshop area. So how do you figure out where that you is? You can put it in the P item and just look at the headers okay. and use. The I mean, just put it in the item and it'll tell you what the uh, where um, the data region is. The yeah, RP view or any of those things, it'll tell you. Okay, so all right, I'm waiting on you guys. Well, what is our rock payload going to be like? Arbitrary add for uh, for ECX. So, so first we have to get an arbitrary value into some memory address, right? Mm -hmm. Because the flash data region, let's just assume it doesn't contain that, that value that we need. Though it might. Um, are all the moves relative to all the two memory moves relative to ECX looks like it. Let's see. Well, first of all, we have to look at uh, which gadgets allow us to write to an arbitrary memory address. So we have gadget number five. And, and 
um, yeah, gadget number 10, 11, and 12 also. So it looks like gadget number 5 is pretty useful for writing to an arbitrary memory address. But the annoying thing about that is it trashes ECX. Yeah. Of course, well, trash ECX, which we need for number 7. So we have to get it into the address and then get our other value in ECX for the addition. Let's see, how can we do this? So first we would have to make a copy of ECX so that we don't destroy it. All right, we're playing Jenga now. This is full on Jenga on steroids. Okay, so we gotta use our heads and be creative. So ECX contains the value we need. We have to store it. So we can make a copy of it with gadget number eight. Okay. So we sort of assume that we're already going to need this, so I'll go ahead and put a uh, move. And I'm going to just make it annotate that ECX equals EA EAX equals, and we're going to assume like get times of information. Because that's what we want to add an arbitrary value to. Let's say get times in. Make life easier for me. All right, what do you guys think next? So as you know, our port, how do, how do we... Oh, actually, no, we need, to, we need to probably save that value, right? So we're going to trash EAX along the way as well. So we need to use a 2 to get some safe address in ECX, and then use 5 to save EAX. Uh, first of all, is my mic volume okay? Cause okay, so you guys want to save EAX right now? Okay, and then you know, you I wasn't uh, really following along, but I was calculating the delta for once you want it. But yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so I wasn't following along, can't verify. Okay, so um, we'll go with uh, what Ford says then. So Ford is suggesting now EAX equals ECX, and we're assuming ECX started with the um, address of get time zone information. Okay. So, um, it looks like our gadgets might clobber EAX, so Ford is suggesting that we save the value of get time zone information to some like uh, hard coded uh, some address or something like that. Is that right? Okay. So um, you're suggesting we use two. Use two to pop a value in ECX, so And this needs to be a memory in flash sixes data, right? So instead of actually looking at what that is, we'll just put data one. Data one, yeah. And then number five. Number five. So I'm going to keep track of what everything is over here. So at this point. ECX equals data one. 
All right, now you're suggesting number five. So move ECX EAX. So now we can say beta one equals the address of, I'm just going to say GTZ or get time zone, all right? All right, now what? Now one thing I want to point out is that it looks like we have just um, saved this value to a data area and this value probably already exists in a data area, right? The import address table. Sure. We, have we can assume it because, like you said, we're mm -hmm. assuming we have yeah, a given column. version of Flash 6, and so static analysis to find the location of the import address table is a valid approach. So I'm going to make a suggestion. Yeah. We know we can do add ECX memory address, right? Mm -hmm. So, and we know that the address of get time zone information is stored in a memory address, right? One that we know has hard coded in the import address table. Sure. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop the delta in the ECX and add the memory address. Mm -hmm. So I know I'd kind of like threw you guys for a loop when I went ahead and said that ECX already contains get time zone information? Get it later? Yeah, but we can just get it later. So, so I mean, the real thing that we're trying to do here is trying to get a value and a memory address, then get the address of that plus 3FCC, 3D00, and the EBX. So we can do number seven. Yes. So let's, with that in mind, let's rebuild our ROP payload, trying to do it that way. Yeah. Four. Okay, so the first, what's the first one we want to do? Okay, so what is what I just suggested? Well, let's put the delta Four. into. Um, oh, so I want to basically, I think if you take EBX and you assume, you want to get into EBX the address of the, uh, uh, no, because, yeah. Well, it doesn't really matter either way, actually. You can do it forwards way or mine, but the point is you're going to be doing uh, four in order to get the value, which is basically the import address table address plus three FCC three D zero zero, so that it just cancels itself out, and then you need to get ECX will just pop out the using to the uh, delta. So I want to go with the simpler one to start with. So yeah, go with I think that's what he said. So let's go so with the pop, pop ECX. Pop, pop ECX first is what you guys are saying. Okay, and this is going to be and that, that that value is oh yeah, the delta. The delta in between get times and information and virtual protect, right? Mm -hmm. Which I also. currently show as three three six eight E. Say that again? Three three six eight E. Okay. So at this point ECX equals Three, three, six, eight, eight. It's important when you're building these raw payloads to keep track of what everything is equal to, because it's pretty easy to like say, oh, well, I can't just override ECX now because it still contains this important value for me. Remember, it's like playing Jingo, you gotta keep track of where everything is. Okay, so what next guys? Now we need to use four to pop the Okay. Like Zeno said, what's what is it? The import address table? Yep, I'm looking so up the actual constant. So this value will be equal to um, table. basically the address of, we'll say like import address GTZ plus FCC. 
Iya. Oke. Okay. And now, now what? Number seven. Number seven. Corey. Corey. Yeah. Um, Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I was heard. So, did how we know where the base address of Flash? How about you, you explain? Uh, we know the base address of Flash because it is not um, uh, ASLR. Right, so we, we are we are trying to bypassing ASLR, but we are kind of assuming there's no ASLR. Oh, okay, okay, that's okay. So, so, in okay so in this case, there's obviously no ASLR in Windows XP VMs. People are just curious about how we would do it if we wanted to bypass ASLR, so I'm just talking about the general strategy here. Right, right. But you know that Flash does not opt into ASLR, so even if we were on a Windows 764 machine, we would know ahead of time where all these gadgets will be located because they're located in Flash, which is randomized. Right. Also, importantly, Flash does not opt into safe SEH, so we could use any of these gadgets that we wanted to uh, write out the exception in or if we wanted to. Now, is Flash relocatable? Yeah. Is that the, if the loader decided that that, that yeah, was so occupied, you'd be... If that saw was occupied, it could move it, but you'll just know, you would do like analysis on the program you're targeting ahead of time. You know, during this program's normal operation, Flash is located at this base address. Okay. How does that, I mean, what happens in the face of ASLR, though, that some other guy might have gotten randomized to that location, and that might push Flash out of the way, or, is, or does it put the non-ASLR guys in place and then decide where to put the other guys? I'm not sure how it. Uh, how I'm it's pretty done. sure it does it in the order that they're found in import address tables. So it's just doing, you know, the recursive search through import address tables. And so if someone else happens to get hit, you know, it's like if Flash is dynamically located when, sorry, dynamically loaded when something like, you know, you browse to a web page and then it says, oh, look, there's Flash plugin, let me load it up. So it is going to be loaded after other stuff commonly in like the web browser sort of scenario, but. But I'm pretty sure it's it's there's no preference for ALSR modules versus others. There's basically just a recursive algorithm in the OS loader. So it is possible that yeah, ASLR, yeah, ASLR yeah. is something that you expect to be something that isn't yeah. ASLR. Yeah, sure that could so happen. Yeah. But this is your best bet. Sure. Usually you can make this work. Anyway. That's just one of those things where it doesn't work first time. Try again. Yeah, I mean you you try to choose a DLL or target that usually will get loaded early so that it gets its preferred base address. Yeah, so, um, okay. So I've got so the, the absolute guys. constant for that, if you want it. Depends. Okay, so... You can write this sort of just underneath the IAT GTZ kind of thing. Yeah, okay. it's uh, 1009E148. And I found that by basically just going in with PEView, looking at the import address table location, and it's basically 9148 offset from the start of the module, and, and okay. uh, PEView so actually is tells you anyways. So this value is actually going to be 1009E148 plus 3F whatever. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Don't you also need to offset that by the GTZ entry in the import address table? No, that is actually the GTZ entry, the address that I gave. Okay, and so this right here should be finally to add ECX, right? Mm -hmm. So, And after all that, we have the address of okay. virtual protect in a register. And now we need to put it in the Now order. you have to, well, at this point, you don't even know what the address of ESP is. So it's hard to write it ahead into the stack where your, um, your stack frame is. So, so this is just one, one part of this. You'll also have to, probably before this, so the, the only gadget that was available in Flash to really put ESP somewhere useful or do something with ESP, you could look, there were no gadgets like Move EAX ESP or Exchange EAX ESP or anything good like that. The best one we had was Add ESI plus 3B 
ESP. And so before we can calculate the address of virtual protect and write it ahead into our our fake stack frame we're making, we'll have to know what the address of the stack is. And then effectively what you do is you make ECX equal to the stack frame and use gadgets like 10, 11, and 12 to write stuff into the stack frame. So I would then set EAX equal to the address of virtual protect, which we've just created. Notice we can't do that directly because there's no move ECX EAX. So it it's is. that's move Number EAX ECX. The other way around. Oh. Yeah. Or yeah, so I guess that would be right. So you have move ECX EAX, so you could move the address of virtual protect into EAX. And then assuming you can then put the address of stack frame into ECX, it would allow you to write the address of virtual protect into the stack frame. And why did the um, the screens turn blue? That, that's why. Okay, so here's um, one sort of prop primitive that we're going to use to get the address of get virtual protect. Now, what else do we have to calculate? Really, everything else we're depending on is based on ESP, right? We got to figure out some stuff about ESP. So ultimately what we need is um, ESP in a register, I'd say. Just so we have some, you know, it's kind of available like a general purpose register for us to use. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to get the value of ESP into a register? So we've got to use, ultimately we want to use number nine. Yeah. And get it into a memory address. Yeah. So before we can do that, we have to set ESI. So we would do something like, so here's another kind of like mini gadget that we'll use. So pop ESI. And then ESI, we'll say like a what flash or data two or something like that, something in flash of data reading. And it's really it's data data two minus it's three, three B. B. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And we also have to which one is this? Oh, we gotta get a zero into that address to make sure it's So what we could do, what I would suggest, is we just make sure that uh, the data region we choose to write to is already zero during the normal operation of the program. All right. So okay. let's just assume that. Data okay. two, I'll put zero in there. So then nine. Okay, so now we've written the address and we've written the value of ESP somewhere. We're still have to get an additional purpose register. Yeah. So in order to use six, we have to set EBX or yeah. So we got to set EBX. So probably do another pop EBX, right? Mm -hmm. And the value would be data two plus seven four eight zero zero three eight three. Plus seven four eight. And you have seven in the Y there are these huge offsets in the uh Did anyone know the answer to that question? The reason is the ones with the goofy offsets are not intended x eighty six instructions. Uh, the reason, what happens is those instructions, those gadgets are actually occurred by splitting an intended instruction in half, all right? So probably for like gadget number six, we had something like, you know, move EBX one, one, two, three, loop, um, you know, increment. It, was like the, it looks like it was a jump yeah. followed by a, a, a move. 
offset buff from uh, EVP. And that's an important part of return oriented programming. You don't actually have to return to an intended like compiler emitted instruction sequence. You can split an x86 instruction in half just to get the instruction you need. And this was literally the best we could do with Flash. I know some of these gadgets are really goofy and awful, but they work, and that was the best we could come up with. So, Corey, I would kind of suggest that we uh, we let the people who are ahead chew on this yeah, for a little right. while, and otherwise we're so just distracting the people who have... So, hopefully I'm giving you guys enough like, uh, information to like, get started with how you do this return-oriented programming, to sort of like build your payload. Um, so, Zeno and Ford, you guys have a better idea of how you would go about doing this now? Hopefully yep. that gets you started at least. Um, but I want to make sure everyone gets the regular depth and a Windows XP mitigations bypass working before I solely focus on this, okay? <laughs>